Okay, folks, we can get started. Um, happy Wednesday. We want to thank all of you for joining us today for this um, important community conversation, part of uh, Providence College's anti-racism talk. Um, Keith, I'll turn it over to you. Great. Um, well, thanks everybody for joining us. Um, I think the format we're going to follow this morning will be some brief introductions. Um, then we're going to watch uh, about a six minute video um, that we think will help set the stage a little bit and open it up to um, conversation and questions with our guests. Um, our, uh, one of our two guests is with us right now, and that's Kat Kerwin, who is a city council representative, and we'll say a little bit more in a few minutes. And the other um, still hoping to join us is Eugene Montero, who is the executive director of the Mount Hope Neighborhood Association and the uh, investigator for the uh, Providence External Review Board, which um, looks into incidents um, of complaints against the police by community members. So, um, and, but just by way of introduction, um, so I'm Keith Morton. I teach in the Public and Community Service Studies Department uh, here at Providence College. And um, I'm the past director of the Feinstein Institute for Public Service. And as a consequence of those roles, um, have gotten to know a lot of different community partners um, and worked alongside them in a number of um, different projects and I've been a board member of the Nonviolence Institute in Providence for 15 years anyway and have a long history of working with youth who are involved in and affected by street and gang violence and that's brought me into a lot of interaction with um, police department and individual officers over the years as well and last thing I think I'd say for now is I'm um, a cultural historian by training, and the perspective I'll bring to today's conversation is largely informed by that um, that part of my identity as well. So, um, Carlene, do you want to say a little about yourself? And yeah. Yes. Thank you, Keith, for that. Um, my name is Carlene Fonseca. I'm the associate director here at the Feinstein Institute for Public Service um, at Providence College. I've been here um, going on my third year now. Um, I was born and raised in Central Falls, Rhode Island, um, and uh, life took me, took me back uh, to Rhode Island. I went away to Washington, D.C. Um, I studied government and got my master's in criminal justice. Um, so this topic is, is very important to me. Um, and here at PC, I run the Feinstein Fellow Pro Fellows Program, which places students out in the community. Um, I also uh, served on the Central Falls City Council for four years. Um, I worked to modernize our criminal code in the city. Um, and I sit on multiple boards in the state as well, um, working with youth um, and adults who are in and out of the criminal justice system. And um, we're very excited to have you all today. I want to introduce um, Kat Kerwin. Um, I've known Kat for going on six, seven years now, um, and I'm very proud of the work that she's done in Providence um, to advocate for um, equitable laws um, in preventing gun violence. Um, Kat Kerwin is a member of the, of the Providence uh, City Council. Um, she's a leading voice in anti-racism initiatives. Um, calls for reducing police violence, increasing funding for youth and community development initiatives, including the Counselors Not Cops initiative, which we'll hear more about. Um, and I also want to introduce Eugene Montero. Um, he will be joining us. Eugene Montero is a military veteran with experience in law enforcement and private security. In addition to running the Mount Hope Neighborhood Association, um, on the east side, he is also the founding director of the Providence County Wrestling Program. Um, he is also the inaugural investigator for the Providence External Review Board, um, which was just started um, as part of the Community Safety Act in 2017. So um, both of our guests bring unique insights to this current debate. Um, on the intersection of policing, racism, and the potential for change in Rhode Island. So we're very excited to have you all join us today. 
Yeah. Is there anything you'd like to add, um, Kat, by way of introduction? Um, no, yeah. but thank you for having me, okay. both of you. I'm glad yeah. to be here. And uh, Eugene Montero um, is just joining us. So. Um, Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Yeah, glad, glad you can join us. I appreciate it. We just did a uh, some brief introductions. Um, and um, we're going to shift for the next few minutes over to uh, a brief video put together by uh, Kimberly Jones called How Can We Win? And it was her response to the aftermath of the killing of George Floyd and some of the protests that uh, happened in, in response to that killing. And we thought this uh, video was particularly useful and appropriate because Kimberly Jones is also the author of The Hate You Give, which was selected as um, a common reading novel for the state of Rhode Island a couple of years back, including a lot of members of campus who participated in that. And um, that novel, it's a, you're considered a young adult novel, but um, it's really a coming of age story that um, is powerful for adults as well. But the um, dramatic tension in the novel itself is built around the shooting of an unarmed um, young black man by a police officer under um, complicated circumstances. So she's somebody who's been thinking about these issues for a long time and her response is powerful. We're not um, offering it as the answer to today's um, conversation but really is a way of underscoring the sort of um, emotional intensity and some of the history that goes into and off, always lies right underneath the surface of the conversation we're going to have. So um, Carlene, if you wanna um, cue that up for us, that would be awesome. I've been seeing a lot of things talking of the people making commentary. Um, interestingly enough, the ones I've noticed that have been making the commentary are wealthy black people making the commentary about we should not be um, rioting, we should not be looting, we should not be tearing up our own communities. And then there's been an argument of the other side of we should be hitting them in the pocket. We should be focusing on the blackout days where we don't spend money. Um, but, you know, I feel like we should do both. And I feel like I support both. And I'll tell you why I support both. I support both because there, when you have a civil unrest like this, there are three types of people in the streets. There are the protesters, there are the rioters, and there are the looters. The protesters are there because they actually care about what is happening in the community. They want to raise their voices, and they are there strictly to protest. You have the rioters who are angry, who are anarchists, kids who really just want to shit up and that's what they're going to do regardless and then you have the looters and the looters almost exclusively are just there to do that to loot now people are like well what did you gain well what did you get from looting i think that as long as we're focusing on the what we're not focusing on the why, and that's my issue with that. As long as we're focusing on what they're doing, we're not focusing on why they're doing. And some people are like, well, those aren't people who are legitimately angry about what's happening. Those are people who just want to get stuff. Okay, well then, let's go with that. Let's say that's what it is. Let's ask ourselves why in this country in 2020, the financial gap between poor blacks and the rest of the world is at such a distance that people feel like their only hope and only opportunity to get some of the things that we flaunt and flash in front of them all the time is to walk through a broken glass window and get it. That they are so hopeless that getting that necklace, getting that TV, getting that change, getting that bed, getting that phone, whatever it is that they're gonna get is that in that moment when the riots happen and if they present an opportunity of looting, that's their only opportunity to get it. We need to be questioning that why. Why are people that poor? Why are people that broke? Why are people that that food insecure, that clothing insecure, that they feel like their only shot, that they are shooting their shot 
by walking through a broken glass window to get what they need. And then people want to talk about, well, there's plenty of people who pull themselves up by their bootstraps and got it on their own. Why can't they do that? Let me explain to you something about economics in America. And I'm so glad that as a child, I got an opportunity to spend time at PUSH where they taught me this, is that we must never forget that economics was the reason that black people were brought to this country. We came to do the agricultural work in the South and the textile work in the North. Do you understand that? That's what we came to do. We came to do the agricultural work in the South and the textile work in the North. Now, if I right now, if I right now decided that I wanted to play Monopoly with you, and for 400 rounds of playing Monopoly, I didn't allow you to have any money, I didn't allow you to have anything on the board, I didn't allow for you to have anything, and then we played another 50 rounds of Monopoly, and everything that you gained and you earned while you were playing that round of Monopoly was taken from you. That was Tulsa, that was Rosewood. There are pla those are places where we built black economic wealth, where we were self-sufficient, where we owned our stores, where we owned our property, and they burned them to the ground. So that's 450 years. So for 400 rounds of Monopoly, you don't get to play at all. Not only do you not get to play, you have to play on the behalf of the person that you're playing against. You have to play and make money and earn wealth for them, and then you have to turn it over to them. So then for 50 years, you finally get a little bit and you're allowed to play. And every time that they don't like the way that you're playing or that you're catching up or that you're doing something to be self-sufficient, they burn your game. They burn your cards. They burn your Monopoly money. And then finally at the release and the onset of that, they allow you to play and they say, okay, now you catch up. Now at this point, the only way you're going to catch up in the game is if the person shares the wealth, correct? But what if every time you share the wealth, then there's psychological warfare against you to say, oh, you're an equal opportunity higher. So if I played 400 rounds of Monopoly with you and I had to play and give you every dime that I made, and then for 50 years, every time that I played, I, if you didn't like what I did, you got to burn it like they did in Tulsa and like they did in Rosewood, how can you win? How can you win? You can't win. The game is fixed. So when they say, why do you burn down the community? Why do you burn down your own neighborhood? It's not ours. We don't own anything. We don't own anything. There is, Trevor Noah said it so beautifully last night. There's a social contract that we all have that if you steal or if I steal, then the person who is the authority comes in and they fix the situation. But the person who fixes the situation is killing us. So the social contract is broken. And if the social contract is broken, why the f do I give a shit about burning the football hall of fame, about burning the f target? You broke the contract when you killed us in the streets and didn't give up. You broke the contract when for 400 years we played your game and built your wealth. You broke the contract when we built our wealth again on our own by our bootstraps in Tulsa and you dropped bombs on us when we built it in Rosewood and you came in and you slaughtered us. You broke the contract, so your target. Your Hall of Fame. As far as I'm concerned, they could burn this bitch to the ground. And it still wouldn't be enough. And they are lucky that what black people are looking for is equality and not revenge. Thank you. Um, and I want to, um, someone posted, I, I misspoke about, um, hey, you know, it was actually Angie Thomas, who's the author, and Kimberly Jones is a, also a young adult author, but of um, other other books that were not part of the state reading. But, um, but I think the intensity of her video and the sort of ability to compress uh, that many centuries of history into six minutes um, gives a, a sense of what, what's at stake. And um, we invited Kat Kerwin and Eugene Montero to join us today, um, partly because of the roles that they're playing right now on the front lines of a lot of the conversations that are happening. 
and we thought we would move right into some um, questions for each of them. And maybe Kat, we can start with you. Um, and um, this way I imagine crosses over into both of your roles with the Rhode Island Coalition Against Gun Violence, but also on the Providence City Council. But um, what's your involvement been in the Counselors Not Cops movement? And um, can you explain a little bit what that's about and how do you see current events driving that movement forward or not? Yeah. Um, so I, I, and I should say, I no longer work for the Rhode Island Coalition Against Gun Violence. I'm um, going back to school next week. So it's not to implicate them in anything I say, um, but the Rhode Island Coalition Against Gun Violence received a grant, um, a really large grant from an individual donor uh, right after the Parkland, Florida shooting. And we had $100,000 to do youth organizing work. Um, and what we found is so our organization, the Rhode Island Coalition Against Gun Violence, hadn't really been built for youth organizing work. We had always kind of done more legislative work. And frankly, the legislative work we had been doing um, was really around addressing the sort of gun violence that impacts uh, suburban white communities, you know, uh, mass shootings, um, school shootings, and not necessarily street related violence or homicides. Um, violence. And so when we got this grant, uh, we knew that we couldn't spend it on our own and it would be better served if we uh, used the money and gave it to organizations that were already doing uh, youth organizing work. And so that's what we did. We regranted the money to Providence Student Union, the Nonviolence Institute, Young Voices, and One Gun Gone. And what we found when we began working with a group of youth. Um, that were all based in Providence and they were Providence high school students was that they didn't really care about the sort of gun violence prevention work we had been doing. Um, you know, it's not to say that like that work isn't necessarily important, but it didn't relate to them. Like I said, it was, uh, you know, work trying to prevent mass shootings, school shootings, uh, shootings that have happened uh, largely like in mostly white communities like Sandy Hook and like uh, Parkland. And what we found is one of the things that the youth asked us to do and that they wanted to work on was a Counselors Not Cops campaign. Um, they were talking about how they didn't necessarily feel safe in their schools because there were armed officers um, and they were talking about how other schools and private schools don't have the same, uh, you know, school to prison pipeline because there aren't armed school officers. And as we were talking to kids about this, we got a lot of really crazy anecdotal evidence, like the fact that in a lot of cases, um, if there's like a school disciplinary issue and a kid is like bad in class, the police gets called instead of, you know, like the principal and instead of like just getting reprimanded, they're handcuffed and put in the back of a police car. Um, so I think right now this issue is extremely timely. Um, you know, there's going to be renewed calls for counselors, not cops in Providence. Uh, there are only eight school resource officers, so it's not a tremendous ask um, because just like not a huge amount of volume, but the armed officers are in the schools, you know, that are kind of deemed as like the bad schools, um, which, you know, like we know that there are no bad schools, bad students, but like, like th these armed officers aren't in classical as often as they're in Hope or as they're in Mount Pleasant. Um, so I think it's a really important issue. I think it's something that's important because it's been coming from the youth that are actually in the schools. Um, and I'm excited to continue working on it. I think now more than ever, there's like renewed calls to make sure it happens. Yeah, thank you. And um, Eugene, maybe as a way to kind of get you um, into the conversation, um, you know, you and I have talked a lot over the years, but um, you're from the Mount Hope neighborhood originally, left to go into the military and into the military police for a while, and came out of that to start your own security company back in um, the neighborhood that you, you were from originally. But um, coming from a military background, um, how do you balance your position as a Black and Native American man um, in your role as an investigator with the Providence External Re Review Board 
and maybe if you could say a little bit about what that is actually um, like just how, how do you put together those different pieces of um, your self in the communities that you care um, so deeply about yes, absolutely um, you know first on the the, the primus external review authority um, it is a civilian oversight. It's actually the only police oversight that exists in the state of Rhode Island. Um, it's a mechanism in which civilians who may not feel comfortable um, through a lot of reasons for, to make a complaint about police misconduct um, through the normal mechanism, which would be the individual police departments. They have this external piece where they're allowed to make these um, complaints and through that um, this would be presented to a board and that board with obviously a lot of input for the person that is making the complaint would have the ability to make decision to investigate create a mediation opportunity if that seemed um, necessary um, and it's 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 a it's a great thing I, and I think something that I, I hope and my whole reason for being involved with it is that at some point would really make impact on the way um, the relationship between the community and police. Um, to your question, um, it's, it's a very loaded question. Uh, <laughs> um, it's the, the, balance, the balance is difficult because as a person gr who grew up in Providence, um, sadly I've had my, my own experiences. I, I always tell the story, like I, I wasn't a bad kid, but I was a kid, right? So I would do knucklehead type things but um, never anything that was a uh, violation of law, right? Or anything like that, just, just being a kid. But sadly, I've had growing up interactions with um, police and sadly also with Providence Police at particular um, that weren't always positive, regardless of what had happened. Um, and, and then kind of bringing that forward um, what was really impactful for me is when I moved back to Rhode Island, um, I, my kids who we lived in the South, we lived in Europe and all these other places had never had any real negative interaction with the, with police until we moved back to Rhode Island in which my first, that first encounter had to do with my son, um, who at the time was between the age of 16 and 17. Uh, he was in high school um, and he was stopped and they accused him or they stopped him because they said he fit the description of somebody who um, might have been selling drugs in the neighborhood. And the sad part is my son was out. Yeah, I sent him to the store to get milk. So at that point, he's carrying milk. <laughs> and his response to them was, were they carrying milk? <laughs> you know, and they had him empty his pockets out on the top of the car. They, um, after finding nothing, they he's pretty much sent them on his way and told him to stay out of trouble. And why that was impactful for me, because it brought pretty quickly an experience that I had around the same age where I was, I would leave my house. I went to Hope High School. I went to wrestling practice after wrestling practice. I went to my job, which at that time was for McDonald's and I had an incident where I pretty much was stopped at the corner of my street and they um, pulled my car over two or three vehicles, emptied my entire car on the streets, left me sitting on the curb with um, my pants pretty much down around my knees um, and told me when they found nothing, um, stay out of trouble. <laughs> so um, the fact that to be to grow up and have those types of experiences. And then my son had that experience was hurtful. Um, it, like, it hit me in ways that, it, to be honest, is really hard for me to explain. Um, but the fact that another generation of my family would even have to experience that is crazy. And also knowing where we have been, right? We lived in Georgia um, and in parts of Georgia where people consider the deep South Right, and we didn't have that experience. We lived in Germany, where there's you know different relationships there, and they had never had that experience. But to come home, and for them to have that experience, 
was was really hurtful. Um, and then you it kind of you tie into the part, and that video touched on it a little bit when it talks about what's been taken from us, right? So my family originated from Virginia, um, the Yorktown area of Virginia. Um, my tribal affiliation is is pretty much if you if you're aware of the Yorktown Naval Base, my my traditional lands for my tribe is that space, which was taken from them. My family, my great great grandfather, moved over thirty people from our family at one time from Virginia to Rhode Island because the, his life was being threatened and his family's life was being threatened, and in that transaction stole the land from us um so like so that video kind of like really touched on some really important points um as it relates to this role as the investigator for para i've always been the type of person to look at it the glass half full versus glass half empty so i look at it as that young man who had that incident that father who experienced that with his son, this uh, Native American uh, and, and individual who knows his family history as now I have an opportunity to have a voice and not a voice in which is in, in any kind of vindictive way, but a voice that I can provide a constructive um, opinion that I hope at some point makes a change. Awesome, yeah, thank you. Thank you, Eugene. Yeah, thank you for that. Um, and I just wanna kind of echo um, in the video that we saw kind of the passion that, that she had um, and the hurt as well. I think we need to acknowledge the hurt that is felt in our communities. Um, and one of the important things she mentions is why in 2020, right? Why in 2020 are we still experiencing these things? Why? Is there such a distrust in Black, Indigenous, people of color um, communities that we have such a distrust in institutions um, and those institutions that have power, especially in, in the law enforcement, right? Um, uh, to pick back off of some questions, um, for Eugene, um, one of the questions I want to ask you is what's your take on the officer's Bill of Rights, um, especially the immunity clause? Um, and then for Kat, one of the questions I want to ask you is you've been um, one of the most vocal voices on Black Lives Matter movement um, on, the, on the council in Providence um, and checking uh, privilege, right, as it pertains to students, especially on Smith Hill, right, in the Providence uh, co college community. Um, you've been very vocal about that. So how have your life experiences brought you to this point, especially as a young white woman and how do others um, get involved as well? So either of you can jump in. Um, so, so if it's all right, I'll, I'll go first. It's the interesting part when you talk about officer immunity, um, if I was a doctor, right? And I made a mistake and that mistake caused an injury or I or my mistake caused a death, um, there would be repercussions, right? Um, and I don't have anything that I could hide behind. Um, and when you think about the police and what their, their responsibility is to protect the public. So when they make decisions that are, because sometimes, you know, things happen. So there, there's a clear difference between, when you think about use of force, um, where a person uses force to secure someone, right? Um, and that's a whole level of conversation there. But then there's a difference when that use of force go beyond, goes beyond. You know, um, the Supreme Court has many times upheld situations where use of force is used um, in a way in which it was to protect society. But once it goes beyond that, then, then that's a problem. So if, in an example, if a person um, is handcuffed, for example, and, the, and an officer decides to strike them after they've, they've been handcuffed, that's an assault, 
right? And and I think that's the difference. And it should be that's a that's a violation of law. So there should be no immunity once it reaches to that point. Um, and just like if I, my example of being a doctor, if I made a mistake, um, which I'm not allowed to, and it causes injury, there's repercussions. So the immunities when a officer violates a law should not exist. Thank you for that. Kat? Yeah, um, so I was born and raised in Providence. And so I think like there's a certain uh, like love and like belief in the city that I have and that kind of prompted me to want to run for office. Um, but also the reality is I didn't grow up in the neighborhood that I was elected in. I grew up um, closer to the Mount Hope side um, behind the Greg's restaurant, if that means anything to you, Eugene. <laughs> um, <laughs> but um, I realized as I was running that, you know, like the reality is the neighborhood I serve is majority low income and majority people of color. Um, and so there's a certain responsibility that comes with that as a white person. Um, and, you know, like, because of all my privilege as a white woman, um, I think like the least I can do is try to reflect the values of the people I serve. Um, and, you know, I, when I did speak out and when I have spoken out about PC in the past, um, it's one of those things that, you know, people get offended by it. And it comes with a lot of criticism, but the reality is when I'm on the doors and when I'm talking to neighbors and people that are from the community, there's a lot of animosity towards the Providence College community and a lot of animosity towards the students because of, I think, decades of, you know, hurt and um, something I hear a lot and something I, I've even heard as a council person when I've, you know, showed up for neighborhood cleanups or things that are sponsored by PC. And it's not just PC students, right? It's also JWU students and um, students from Bryant who also live in the area over there. But the language that I think sometimes white students who aren't from Providence use is really careless. And, you know, they'll say things like, oh, this is the ghetto or, oh, we don't want to go too far down Smith Street. And, you know, like people that live in the neighborhood and don't just live there because it's like a convenience and it's close to school and they can pay whatever they want in rent. Um, they're hurt by that a lot. Um, and so I think it's one of those things where it's important to speak out um, and it's important to talk about these things. Uh, and for me, you know, like growing up in Providence and being a white person, um, in like a time right now, uh, it feels like there's some sort of responsibility. Um, and you know, like I'm not perfect. So like I mess up all the time and I've like said things that even, you know, like you have to be willing to like be checked by your black and brown friends and that happens all the time. Um, but I think it's more like, especially for white people, it's like more trying to do their best to like speak out and say things. Uh, because a lot of times, I mean, I, I see online too, I think a lot of people, a lot of white people won't post things or won't speak out because they're afraid of like how it might be perceived and they don't, they want to be very sensitive. Um, and so I think like in terms of getting involved, I think like the best thing that, you know, people with like a lot of immense privilege and educational privilege and white privilege um, can do is just like be honest um, you know, like, you're not going to do it right. Like all white people are racist. It's how people say all men are sexist. Um, and like, be willing to be open to criticism when you are wrong and you do do racist things because you're not perfect, but also just like speak out when you can, because there's a responsibility there. Because like, I mean, we saw in that video, these things are still happening. Yeah. Thank you both. Yeah. We just have a couple more questions um, and then we're going to invite the audience to um, use the question and answer function on the Zoom. Um, start loading up some questions for us so we can interact with you um, using that, that mechanism. Um, and um, Eugene, uh, maybe just a question for you about um, your role with the Mountain Hope Neighborhood Association. 
And then um, I think Carlene has a question around the defunding of the police um, that we can move into. But um, how does your role as the executive director of the Mount Hope Neighborhood Association um, tie into this conversation, if at all, um, Eugene? Well, I can explain what the Mount Hope Neighborhood Association is a little bit. I'm not sure everybody's familiar. Sure. Um, so the Mount Hope Neighborhood Association, well, we recently we just went through a name change. It's now called the Mount Hope Community Center. And why that is really important because when it was, when it began, it was the East Side Community Action, which did a lot more community service, community um, advocacy type work which is a little different than what a neighborhood association should serve as. Um, so we're making an attempt to kind of go back to our roots for the community. Um, the, I guess my role, I, I, I've been fortunate in, in growing up, my family was always involved in some way with at that time, the Eastside Community Action and even the neighborhood association when it made that transition. Um, and then even coming back to Rhode Island, um, to, I, I joke because part of that was I was approached first by at the time Ray Watson, who was at the time the executive director, and then very um, directly informed by my mother, who, who said that you will get involved. <laughs> um, because more as, it, and that's important because that's, when you talk about responsibility to your neighborhood. Um, and I have been involved every since. So I think it's real important because the, this community in which I grew up in um, is important. It was important to the foundation of my family when they moved to Rhode Island. Um, and so, and the people that are here, I, I feel a certain level of responsibility to do what I can, whatever that means. I think it's related because there's a number of individuals that live in the community who were the same as I when I didn't have a voice. And, and, and that's the way that I would describe it. I didn't have a voice where I felt I could speak up um, when what happened to me, I didn't feel like I had a voice when what happened to my son, which was not in Providence, but still the same. Um, there are many other people who are in that situation where because of the, the systems in place, they don't feel like they have a voice. So if I can use this role, whether para or with Mount Hope to create that voice that, that speaks, um, and I hope I, I do it right in speaking for them, um, I think that's very, very important to provide that opportunity. Yeah. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you for that, Eugene. The last question I wanna ask, um, both of you before um, we turn it over to the audience um, is uh, we've been hearing a lot of talk right about defunding the police and what does that mean what does that look like um, I think it's a term that folks um, haven't heard before and people are like anxious about it other people are um, embracing it um, so if you can maybe just give some input into what does what does that mean when people are talking about defund, defunding the police? What, what are we talking about here? Um, I can go. So uh, I've been working a lot with the organizers that, um, that helped pass the Community Safety Act on a broader campaign to defund the police. Um, and from my perspective, and this isn't true for everyone that is supportive of defund the police, but from my perspective, um, the root of this work comes um, from a belief in abolition. Um, and you know, as an abolitionist, I think it's um, I think it's important to like recognize that, especially in low-income communities, especially on Smith Hill, um, it's hard to say abolish the police or defund the police because people are scared and even people that I think are generally supportive um, are turned off by that because the reality is you know we can there are a lot of like 
the leftist anarchist types that are mostly white and um, very well educated or have a lot of educational privilege, you know, on the east side that will do things like, you know, abolish the police, like defund, fuck 12 and all of that. And it's like one thing when you're saying that in certain neighborhoods and you're saying that in places where there aren't really violence, but it's another thing when you're saying that in communities that um, experience violence every day. Um, and so I've tried to be cautious as I talk about this because in my neighborhood, you know, there are murders, there are murder suicides, there are is gang violence. And it's important to note that like, we don't think that like, we can just abolish the police and not have systems in place. We believe that we need to have a better system and have people protecting us that actually are protecting us. Because a lot of times I get calls from people after violent incidents happen. They'll be like, hey, Kat, just so you know, um, there was an incident on my street. Uh, there was, you know, a domestic violence dispute, but I know my neighbors are undocumented or I know my neighbors are this. And so I did not feel like calling the police would have helped the situation. And I hear that all the time. It, and it, it stems too. like, it could be for something nonviolent, like a noise complaint fireworks, or it could be for something that like, actually it would have been like, it's pretty necessary for someone to intervene in that situation. And a lot of people recognize that the police don't necessarily actually create a safe environment or promote safety. And so for me and from my perspective as someone that's been working with the organizers who are really leading this work, um, you know, the defund the police movement is talking about like some stuff we've already talked about today. It's about how like there is a lot of harm and there is like reparations to be paid and we need to start investing in communities that um, haven't had a lot of the resources ever and divesting all of this money in police if they're not even offering real protection. Um, so, yeah. So I, I, I think, you know, that's, it, it, that's a difficult conversation because I personally would never want to be in a situation where God forbid something happened and I had no one to call. Right, so I, I, I can't say I'm, I am a supporter of defund the police, but do I think that structurally something should be done different? Absolutely. You know, and maybe it's the model in which police are rewarded. So uh, currently we know in many police departments, um, your reward is based on your number of arrests, right? So is that systematically a problem? My opinion is yes. Um, could there be a model that also includes your community involvement, whatever that means? Again, I don't have the complete answer. I, I think there's definitely some room for restructuring and thinking about what policing is. Um, you know, like when you look at, you know, in, so I, in the military, I had the opportunity, uh, I'll call it an opportunity, um, to go to a couple of different country situations. Um, and, and with that, there were times in which, as part of that mission, your job was to get to know the people that were in that area. And in getting to know them, you created this mechanism in which they, were, they felt more comfortable in providing information. And because they, they provided this information, it allowed us to better um, accomplish our mission, whatever that was. And I think policing should kind of be looked at in that way. So if there was more of an effort of getting to know the community, so you know, a lot of times you'll see a, a police car pass by, there's no wave, there's no hello or officer walk by, there's no conversation with the individual. But if there was this real, true community policing type environment, um, I think one, the community will feel um, more comfortable in going to them when something is wrong. I was involved in a situation in which uh, it was a training that a, it was um, a, a, a military training. And in this training, what it showed was a person who their child was sick. And what happened was 
when the police came on scene, that individual quickly handed their child to the officer. The interesting part about that, I don't know any situation that a mother is gonna hand their child to a stranger. And the reason that she was able to do that is because she felt comfortable with that individual. She knew him, she was comfortable, she knew that his, what his thought process was the best interest of that child. And so she gave her child to that officer. And, and, and the, there's more to the story and the end result was a very positive, the, 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 the officer was able to help um, resuscitate the child in the situation because the child wasn't breathing. Um, but that wouldn't happen in a regular situation because of trust. So unless policing includes a model which builds community trust, then it's a failed plan. Thank you, Eugene and Kat. Um, and I just want to add one thing um, about the defunding uh, movement. Um, nine and 10 uh, calls that come into 911 are nonviolent um, calls. Um, and for example, in Central Falls, um, our police budget is 25% of the city budget. Right, and during, during COVID, no city employee received a full um, raise, but the police department did, right? Um, and a lot of those calls, whether it's domestic violence, homelessness, drugs, um, these are nonviolent crimes. And a lot of those resources, the police shifts it over to organizations that work with these organizations, right? But they don't necessarily get the funding to do so. Um, and when we talk about representation as well, um, one of the things that we did in Central Falls is we passed an ordinance for hiring in public safety, so both fire and police, um, because right now our city population is probably 80, 80 for 85 percent black and brown, and the police force is 80 to 85 percent white, right, as, as well as fire. Um, I think now we have one or two firefighters who speak Spanish in the community where majority is Spanish speaking. If you make a call in and you can't kind of communicate to folks or if the fire men and women show up, um, they, they can't communicate with the residents. So that caused a problem as well. Um, so one of the things we did in hiring is we gave extra points if you're a woman, veteran, um, if you speak a la the language um, of 15% of the population or more. Um, and we did that kind of to, to increase the representation um, and make it more uh, representative of, of the people that they're serving. So I, I do agree that there needs to be different, shifting different policies and methods, as well as allocating different resources um, to, to social services and kind of decriminalizing those laws. Um, we want to open it up to uh, questions. So right now, um, we, have, we have a few questions around um, how do you, how can members of PC be better advocates and partners with the Smith Hill uh, community? Does anyone have anything to say about that? I'll jump in on this one. Um, so I've been a pretty vocal um, opponent to some of the actions of Providence College. I think number one, uh, there's a responsibility in the student body to really push administration um, and to demand more from administration to be a good community partner. Um, you know, the impacts of Providence College on the neighborhood are immense. Um, you know, especially in the off-campus housing areas, you know, the Oaklands, the Pembrokes, on those streets, the housing costs are just rising and they're rising and they're rising. And it begins to impact the entire community. Um, and so not only, you know, like is partying an issue and loud noise and stuff like that, but it's also really the housing costs and how, um, how there are a lot of negative impacts on the neighborhood that's driven by the college. And that's not to say there aren't positive impacts because we know, you know, like having a good community partner in a higher education institute can be really amazing. And I just think that there needs to be, um, there needs to be more resources from administration in the community and there needs to be um, 
there needs to be a student body like activism voice that's pushing administration to do better. Um, because something that I found when, you know, I've made comments about PC is that the people that are, you know, slamming me for it are mostly, you know, white male students from out of state and the people that are reaching out to me and thanking me are students of color that are from Providence and they tell me horrible, horrible, horrible stories about things that have happened to them on campus. And so I think like, especially white students at Providence College, there's a responsibility for y'all to like speak out, push administration to do better and like, you know, actually make the PC a safe environment for students of color. So, so I'll chime in quickly. Obviously, I'm, I'm, I'm not in the PC area, but I, I think in general, um, I think the simple solution is to get involved. So if you are in a community, living in a community, get involved, get to know who the players are, what are the organizations, what are they doing, and find out where you fit. So if there's a place that you can fit and do good, then do that. Um, I, I think to, I, I, it, well, that's one of those things that I don't think is rocket science. I think it's just simple. Just um, put yourself in a place to do good. Awesome. Thank you. Um, we also have a question comment about uh, mentoring um, African American Latina ex students. Um, so uh, somebody, uh, Stephen mentioned, perhaps every faculty or staff member should uh, mentor a student. Um, and so does anyone have anything to add? Or Keith, maybe you wanna talk about um, the first generation program that's on campus? Sure, I'm, I'm guessing most, a lot of our audience is familiar with that already, but it's um, the quick version would be that for probably the last six or seven years, um, Providence College has been um, running and revising a program that is intended to um, attract and um, recruit and support first generation students coming to campus. And it's been looking for mechanisms that um, engage the rest of the campus in making it as supportive an environment as possible, including mentoring by faculty and staff, or at least making that a, an option for the first gen students. Um, for all that, um, it in, continues to be sort of a complicated space um, for the same reason that I think a lot of mentoring programs are complicated. And that is that um, different young people want and need different things and putting them into a singular mentoring program um, doesn't satisfy what everybody's looking for. So the challenge is always, how do I have a support system or a mentoring system that is adaptive enough to respond to students who are coming from really different places? But I think there's a lot of evidence in the uh, mentoring literature, actually, that really goes to um, Eugene's point about getting involved. And probably the single most um, powerful reason that people who make a life of service give for having made that life, and it goes back um, actually Kat and Eugene to both of your stories I think, is that uh, a caring adult asked them to come along when they were a young person and gave them something meaningful to do um, and valued them as a young person for doing it. So I think there's um, ways that it's not only having faculty and staff serve as mentors, but it's actually what are they doing together that can really help build some of the relationships that we're talking about. That would be pretty exciting. Um, yeah. Another question we have from Vin Marzullo is how many PVD police complaints are currently under review by the review board? I'm not sure if you would have that off the top of your head, Eugene. Um, sadly, I do. Uh, um, so currently we have 12 that are, have been assigned for investigation. Uh, I believe five that have been suggested for mediation. And we have two internal investigations that um, PARA has elected to uh, monitor the police current internal investigations. Awesome, thank you. Um, we have a question from Genevieve Medina. Um, does counselors not cops also pertain to non-academic spaces? 
outside of schools and in our communities? If so, how might that look within the policing system? I can answer this one. Um, counselors, not cops, is pretty confined to the Providence Public Schools. Um, like I said, basically as the ordinance is written, it's just an ask to eliminate the eight school resource officer positions that currently exist and reallocate the funding to social and emotional support in Providence schools. Basically, there's like a law in Rhode Island that there, I think the ratio is there needs to be like a counselor in every school at like a 450 to one ratio, I believe. Um, but in Providence, uh, you know, guidance counselors can count as this. So guidance counselors who are doing like purely academic support and not counselors that are doing um, social emotional support or like school psychiatrists. Um, and I think this is really important because a story that is really heartbreaking, but um, I try to keep on the top of my mind is that a few years ago when Eddie Parsons was uh, murdered on the first day of school, uh, there was uh, a mental health officer that came to school the next day and was available with open hours and no one went to the open hours. And so obviously our students, uh, thousands of them either saw this or knew Eddie Parsons or, you know, like were viscerally impacted by, you know, like the, this extremely traumatizing event of seeing a shooting like right outside of the school, but no one went because they hadn't ever had like, an actual mental health officer in their school likely and so they were in a position to just like go speak to someone they didn't know um, and so I think that kind of speaks to like this need for resources more than ever. Thank you. Um, someone asked as to driving by without saying hi are you aware of the repercussions citizens may have for speaking with police? Can, can you repeat that one? Um, someone said, as to driving by without saying hi, are you aware of the repercussions citizens may have for speaking with police? Repercussions. I, I, my, my comment was really more about community policing um, and, and just providing a, a different environment. So a lot of times when community members are interacting with police it's it's of a negative nature whether it's the police officer that that initiates that conversation or the individual I just I believe that community policing is a much different environment um, and shouldn't have any negative impact um, again that's an, an opinion a personal opinion awesome. Another question that we have um, is I'd like to keep this conversation going. Can we invite a law enforcement officer from Providence to offset the current echo chamber? Um, and I can start by answering that. Um, we've worked with Providence um, uh, police on several different other panels and we'd be happy to invite them to some of these conversations as well to get their input. Yeah, and it's a conversation that I know um, the chief of police in Providence, Hugh Clemens, is very open to having um, and is actually, he's trying to gather as much input as they're thinking about things as they can. Um, if, I, if I can um, just add one comment and we're getting close to the time that we're going to have to formally end our, our session, but um, sort of thinking about this um, as a cultural historian a little bit, I think the big question that's buried underneath it all has to do with um, what social sciences would call legitimate violence. And there's an argument going back to sociology in the 19, early 1900s that argues that um, one way to think about what a state is, is that a state is the community body that is allowed to use violence for legitimate purposes, usually through the military and the police, those are the two arms. But that presumes that the community of people have granted the state permission to use violence under those circumstances. 
And in a democracy, that permission can be withdrawn by the people when they start to think that that violence is no longer legitimate. And if you think about um, George Floyd's death and the sort of number of factors that went into making that such a catalytic moment, um, what I, the short version of it, to go right to the, the conclusion, is that what it did was strip away almost completely the moral authority of the police in that moment. And it raised an existential question for the city of Minneapolis, which is, do we have moral authority as a city government if this is the police force that we're supporting? And it, they had to revisit their identity as a civil institution and figure out how to approach this question of legitimate violence. And they did it by charging the officers and so on. But I think what this um, series of ongoing pattern of about a thousand um, deaths um, as a result of police um, shootings per year um, and disproportionately affecting black and um, Hispanic communities <coughs> is really raising this question of um, the legitimacy of violence and policing. And in a lot of ways, what I think is going on right now is through this whole entire conversation this morning is that we're revisiting where we think some of those boundaries are. And the, um, there's a, a, a perspective that I think Eugene, you've represented well, which is um, that we really need to move much more deliberately in the direction of community policing that is built on relationships, trust over time, um, training officers in de-escalation, mediation, counseling, maybe even sending out teams of officers and social workers. And then there's kind of an abolitionist perspective, Kat, which I think you articulated really well, which is to say that um, we need to imagine a future that just doesn't have a place for this kind of violence, legitimate or not legitimate, to be the um, principal tool of uh, maintaining civil society. And I think what's exciting about this moment right now is that we don't know quite where it's gonna take us, but I think that what policing looks like might change really dramatically over the next five to eight years um, for the first time in recent history. Um, and I, I find that really um, exciting and, and hopeful. Um, so maybe just time for one or two more questions, Carlene, and then we can um, call it a morning. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I've been trying to answer the questions on here as well and follow up with some folks. Um, someone, uh, Cara Martinez, she said she graduated 30 years ago and thinking like we, uh, the students, maybe a PC community in general were horrible stewards. Um, so uh, I think she wants, to, she wants to know what is the involvement between the two now? Is there anything formal that's going on? Does anyone have any suggestions? as how we can kind of formalize that relationship. And then another person asked um, about, um, about any connections their high school counselor working with black, brown, first generation students and kind of what resources are available. Um, it was an anonymous attendee. So um, if you're on, I can definitely share some of those resources on campus, but um, I'm with you in that we need a lot more resources for, for all of our students on campus. Is there anything formal do you guys, does Kat or Keith, do you know, between the PC community and the Smith Hill neighborhood? Yeah, I, I think there, there's, um, there's opportunities, but um, right, right now there's, particularly with the pandemic underway, there's sort of complicated opportunities. Um, there's a, or a group that meets um, somewhat informally once a month called the Smith Hill Partners Initiative. And that's simply the representatives of uh, um, a dozen or 15 different institutions in the neighborhood um, committed to community building that, um, get together, I'd be happy to share the schedule of those meetings and it's open to anybody who'd like to just visit or become a part of one of the initiatives. Um, there's another related organization called SHARP, 
which is uh, more of a neighborhood advocacy organization for people who'd like to work more directly on um, uh, advocating for a community's point of view in particular on issues, specific issues that range from garbage pickup to cleaning up housing to making more affordable housing available. Um, I'm happy to make that kind of a connection. There's um, an elementary school in the neighborhood that's going to be opening or doing some sort of remote learning starting in just a few weeks. And they're always very receptive to um, support from the outside. But again, back to the point I think both of our guests have made this morning, um, finding ways to connect, get involved, um, have relationships um, with people so that when things do begin to get complicated, you have something to build on or, or work from. I don't think there's really any substitute for that. Mm -hmm. um, and then I think the other um, thing that I just really appreciate from both of our guests, and they've said it explicitly, but also modeled it for us, is um, we've talked through um, a number of really um, complicated and difficult questions, um, things with the whole people have very reactive responses to quite often. And I think we've done it in a way that has really created um, thoughtful space for and curiosity about where would I go next to find out more about this. And so I think the value of being in relationships um, that you build up over time with people having that trust is that you can begin to have those conversations about things that um, are a little bit difficult or scary in different ways. So, so that, that's a long answer, but that would be it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Maybe the last one, um, picking up on Eugene's comment earlier about police measurements, how does the Providence City Council measure the effectiveness? Eugene, what should the measurements be? This could be for either or. So, I, so um, policing started, the, well, the principles of policing is based on an individual named Robert Peel from 1829. And one of, and there's nine principles. One of my favorite is number seven, and I pulled it up on my screen just to make sure I said it correctly. Um, but it's, uh, the police at all times should maintain a relationship with the public that gives reality to the historic traditions that the police are the public and that the, pub that the public are the police. And I, and I think that's an important quote because, you know, it's, it kind of speaks to the point that um, policing or the measurement or even the effectiveness of, effectiveness of police is based on what the community thinks. And so if the community thinks that the police is being effective based on their actions, then they're more apt to trust them, they're more apt to interact with them. And I think it's just a powerful piece. And these nine principles Interesting enough, if you go on any police department's website, you'll find some reference to these nine principles. Um, the problem is, I think in today's policing, they've bared away from those principles a little bit. Um, one other important talks about their true effectiveness. The test of police efficiency is the absence of crime and disorder and not the visible evidence of police action in dealing with them. So it's not the show of force as it is the effect of the fact that there's no crime. So um, the measurements, like I had mentioned before, should be based on more of their actions, not so much how many arrests that they have. Can you share that? Please? I should, yes, absolutely. All right. Are there any last thoughts before we close out? I, I know we are over time, but it's been such a good conversation. And um, like we mentioned, this is one of many conversations to come and uh, Feinstein Institute is willing to connect um, the PC community to different um, local organizations, neighborhood folks, um, as well as continue these conversations. This is what we do on campus and this is what we're here for. So if anyone has any specifics afterwards, um, we can definitely connect. But any last thoughts from any of our panelists?
Thanks for having us. No, thank you very much. I'm really appreciative that uh, I was allowed to participate in this. I, I thought it was a very healthy conversation. So thank you. Thank you to everyone. Keith, go ahead. No, just uh, same, same. I really appreciate Kat and um, Eugene, you're making the time to be with us. Um, it wasn't allowing you to, Eugene, it was like really hoping you would. And um, I just know how packed both of your schedules are and, and how deeply these issues concern you. So um, really appreciate the thoughtfulness and the time. So thanks. Absolutely. All right, enjoy, have a good weekend all.